Can I have your attention, please? So, very good. Good afternoon, everyone who's here or joining us online from around the world. Welcome to day four of Web 2023. My name is Afra Halothman, and maybe some of you already know me, Marine Science PhD student here. In the last days, we had offered inspiring and exciting talks and events, and I hope you all enjoyed everything so far. Please stay tuned, as we still have more activities are coming around campus. But for today, we are going to have a special keynote with Rafik Mackey, talking about shaping the global science and technology mega trends of our time, how venture capital is pushing the edges and changing the world. And if you would like to have more discussion with Rafik Mackey after the talk, there will be an open talk with him today around 4 p.m. outside the auditorium. And also, uh, uh, the session will be one hour long between the talk and the questions. And the last 15 minutes of the session will be opening for questions. Those who are joining us online, please send your questions in writing. Uh, I would like also to remind you, don't forget, we have today an uh, improved performance from 7.30 to 9 p.m. at the auditorium. So please make sure to come. It's going to be really fun. We have also another keynote at 5.30 with Lama Nachman about changing the narrative from human to competition to human to collaboration. Uh, just a reminder, for those who would like to enjoy the talk in Arabic language, the talk will be translated. So if you would like to borrow the translation unit, it's going to be available outside the auditorium. Just a kind reminder turn, uh, re to return all the units at the end of the session, please. And now I would like to introduce our moderator for this session, Kaus Tabrovost, Professor Lawrence Karen. And I hope you all a wonderful day. Thank you. So uh, thank you so much, and uh, it's great to see everybody here. Um, I hope everybody's having a great time, day four um, of WEP. I hope you're enjoying the program so far. I think it's uh, very exciting and uh, getting even more exciting. Um, this, this session, I think, is going to be super, uh, super interesting. Um, we are very, very fortunate to have uh, Dr. Rafiq Maki uh, today uh, with us, and he'll be speaking in a moment. He uh, has done uh, a lot of things, as, as I'll explain to you. Um, but he um, is involved in uh, uh, helping to um, fund some of the uh, most interesting technology truly on the edge uh, of what's being done in the world. I, I, and I know this personally um, from some of the stuff that he has, uh, that I'm aware of. So, for example, uh, he and his, the, the company uh, he is with um, funded uh, some of the early work in quantum computing, which is truly at the edge of, uh, of computational science. Uh, a company that he helped support is now traded uh, uh, on the U.S. Uh, stock exchange. So let me, let me um, formally uh, introduce uh, uh, Dr. Maki. Let me also just note his name, he told me. Uh, Rafiq uh, means friend in Arabic, and Maki means Mecca. So we have a friend from Mecca uh, today. So Rafiq, thank you so much. So uh, Dr. Uh, Maki is the head of tech, is the head technologist and fellow of Muba Mubadala Capital, and he oversees the technology strategy and roadmap uh, for for Mubadala Ventures Global Investment Portfolio. So as I mentioned, he has been involved in some very exciting investments, including in quantum computing. He is a long-time uh, veteran of the semiconductor industry, most recently serving as executive fellow of Global Foundries. He has previously served in academia, including he uh, being a tenured professor at the University of North Carolina in, in Charlotte, the dean of IT at UAE University, and the founding vice president of research at Mazdar Institute of Science, Technology in Abu Dhabi. So um, Dr. Uh, Maki is no stranger to this part of the world. He spent um, 12 years in the UAE. 
In government, Dr. Maki served as the head of, um, of strategic planning for the Abu Dhabi Education Council and senior advisor to the Director General. He invented the IDDT pulse method for testing integrated circuits, published over 60 referee papers, and received numerous honors and awards, including the first Citizenship Scholars Medal for his research. He is especially interested in innovation. This is where he's focusing uh, today. Uh, at the intersection of technology and biology, Rafiq advocates for individuals with special needs and was a member of the Community and Legacy Committee of the Special Olympics 2019 Summer Games. Dr. Maki's keynote is, is entitled Shaping the Global Science and Technology Megatrends of Our Time. Welcome to CALST, Dr. Rafiq Maki. Thank you, Larry. Thank you very much, Larry. Wow, what a great group here. Good to see you. This is an amazing place you have here. It's an amazing campus. It's an amazing city. And what an amazing story you're building here at, at KAUST. I'm really privileged and honored to be with you today. And I'm going to take the next 30 minutes or so to talk about the role of venture capital in shaping the future of science and technology. We'll focus on the megatrends that are shaping our future. And let me grab the clicker here. And I'd like to start by taking, taking a look at the first two decades of this 21st century and the technology and innovation that is impacting our lives. So starting with, in the middle there, CRISPR and gene editing. Think what that has meant to medicine and the biosciences in general. From CRISPR to Google, from Alibaba and Amazon shaping and changing, fundamentally changing retail, to things like the smartphone, from the smartphone to DNA sequencing, the first sequencing of the human genome done in 2003 as part of the Human Genome Project. Cost out about a billion dollars to sequence the human genome. Think what that has meant. These first two decades of the 21st century have had an incredible, incredible impact on our daily lives. I mentioned the smartphone. The smartphone, the latest smartphone today, if you take a look at the iPhone 13, it's got some 15 billion transistors in it, performing some 15.8 trillion operations per second in the palm of your hand. Right? What an amazing two decades those have been. And I thought it would be interesting to compare the first two decades of the 21st century in terms of the impact on humanity to the first two decades of the 20th century. Now, the impact was different because the inventions, the innovations of the first two decades of the 20th century were more fundamental, right? were more infrastructure, were more invention than innovation. So consider, for example, the Wright brothers ushering in the age of flight. We go from there to the Lumiere brothers who ushered in the age of film. We go from there to blood prototyping, A and B prototype happened during the first two decades. We go from there to air conditioning invented in the first two decades. We go from there to Einstein and the photoelectric effect invented in the first two decades of the 20th century. We go from there to the assembly line and Henry Ford and the impact that, that has had on uh, uh, mass production. And my favorite one of all of the first two decades of the 20th century, Reginald Fessenden. He's my favorite because he was an electrical engineer. I'm an electrical engineer. Uh, Reginald Fessenden, the story goes, was sitting on the lake and throwing some stones into the lake. And he watched as the stones were making these circular waves, 
And it seems that the, these circle waves can grow and grow and go endlessly into the lake. And that gave him an idea. He says, what, I, what if I use the same concept to send my voice, my speech, wirelessly across the airways? So I'm going to get a carrier signal, and I'm going to modulate that carrier signal with my voice. And if I have the right transmitter on one end and the right receiver on the other end, I can send speech. And so amplitude modulation, AM radio, was born. And the first radio message was broadcast on Christmas Eve in 1906. And imagine that Fessenden did all that without the internet. He didn't need to Google anything to come up with this, uh, with this idea, right? He did it by just thinking, sitting on the lake and wondering what if. So those first two decades of the 20th century changed life forever. Changed it in a different way than innovations today change it. And so what's fundamentally different between innovation back then and innovation today is that innovation today is more and more about a scholarship of integration, building on previous work, combining previous technologies together. An example of that is recombinant DNA, which is responsible for much of the production of insulin today. Recombinant DNA, the patent, was built on 24 other technologies, right? And this is more and more of an example of what innovation is like today. You're building on building on building on previous information. And what's mind-boggling to me is that given these massive innovations that happened from the early part of the 20th century to the early part of the 21st century, it took thousands of years before somebody figured out that you can put wheels on luggage. Isn't that mind-boggling? Imagine we split the atom, we went to the moon and back before somebody figured out that, hey, you can put wheels on, on luggage. When I was growing up in the 60s, we didn't have any such thing. When we traveled, my mom and dad, you know, did the heavy lifting, right? But we take it for granted that sometimes, sometimes the scholarship of integration is the answer to a problem, and the answer is staring us in the face, but we, we don't see it. And the question is, is the answer to fighting cancer staring us in the face, but we're not seeing it? Is the answer to curing Alzheimer's staring us in the face, but we're not seeing it? Right? So the scholarship of integration, notwithstanding this oddity here, is responsible for immense innovation over the past 75 years or so. So from the atomic age, to the race to space age, to personal computing, to the digital revolution brought on by the internet, to smart mobility and the knowledge revolution we are in today. A lot of this happened because of the scholarship of integration, bringing these separate technologies together into a solution of something new. And there's a lot of stuff to cover here on this slide, but I want to choose one. I want to choose one, and only one. I want to choose the integrated circuit that was invented in 1959. Why the integrated circuit? The integrated circuit is perhaps among the greatest innovations of all time. Without the integrated circuit, you wouldn't have the smartphone I was talking about earlier. With, without the integrated circuit, we wouldn't have the internet. Without in the integrated circuit, we wouldn't have personal computing. The integrated circuit today is the biggest driver, the biggest engine of information and knowledge production in the history of humankind. Right? And the integrated circuit will also be the driver of the five megatrends that I'm, talking, that I'm going to talk about next. Electrification, personalization, robotization, convergence, and smart edge. 
Together, these five megatrends are going to give rise to a new reality that we only dreamed about, that we only imagined in science fiction. Let's start on the right-hand side with the smart edge. So the trend there is to do real-time machine learning at the edge. Today, we can do inference on the edge, meaning we can do the learning in the data center, and we can design these chips that are smaller than the chips that do the learning and put them on the edge and do inference. The goal is to do real-time machine learning on the edge. Why? Because we cannot afford to have these projected trillions of sensors around the planet collecting data and transferring the data back to the cloud to be analyzed. It's just too much data being transferred back to the cloud. We just don't have the capability to do that. So what you want to do is you want to do your analytics on the edge, your compute on the edge, your decision making on the edge. Next one I want to talk about is the one next to it, convergence. That's about bringing technologies together. For example, bringing technology with biology. And my favorite there is digital biology. Examples of digital biology, brain-computer interfaces. These are possible today. Now, they're still in their infancy, but they're happening today. A brain-computer interface is implanted today in an ALS patient that is almost completely disabled. That ALS patient is using the brain-computer interface to communicate with a computer or with a phone to tweet by just thinking about it. This technology is here today. I say it's still in its infancy because it's a little slow. It requires tracking the eye movements of the patient. So for example, the patient looks at a keyboard and if the patient focuses on a letter as the patient wants to form a word, then he thinks about clicking and the brain-computer interface that's implanted picks up the signal and does the click. So now the first letter is formed. So this takes a little bit of time. But then the patient can put the letters together into words. Because of the ability to click, you can open a window, click on the Twitter app, begin your sentence, and then send a sentence, tweet by just thinking about it. Right? As I said, it's here today. It's still in infancy. But we're not too far out. In your lifetime, in your lifetime, we will have non-invasive brain-computer interfaces that turn our brains into encyclopedias. This is not science fiction, folks. This is going to happen. The technology, the ideas are here. It's an engineering problem that has to be developed and solved. And it will be developed and solved. Moving over to robotization. Many aspects, many dimensions to, to robotization. I'm going to select one. If you happen to be in Phoenix, just outside Phoenix, and you want to hitch a ride somewhere, don't call Uber, OK? Promise me you're not going to call Uber. Call Waymo. Why call Waymo? Waymo will send a car to pick you up without a driver. This is happening today. In fact, two years ago, I went to Phoenix. I downloaded the Waymo app and ordered a Waymo car. It showed up to pick me up without a driver. Seriously, without a driver. Now, you can see that on TV, but until you experience it, it's something to behold. Car shows up, parks, I get into the car. It asks me if I'm ready to go, right? I click on a button and say, yes, go. And it drops me off and then goes to pick up the next person. No driver. No safety driver. Technology is here. It's happening. Now, outside Phoenix, to be fair, wide roads, 
not too much traffic. But Waymo is testing its technology in downtown San Francisco. For those of you who've been to downtown San Francisco, you know, if you can, if you can get an autonomous car to work there, it can work anywhere. Uh, downtown San Francisco, lots of traffic, lots of people walking around, people on bicycles, uh, motorcycles. It's a complete mess down there in downtown uh, San Francisco. And Waymo is testing its next generation car, which is in a Jaguar, right, there. And there will be a day when Waymo will operate in San Francisco. And like I said, if you can do it in San Francisco, you can do it anywhere. Let's pick up the next one, personalization. Personalized medicine, for example, precision oncology. Tumors act differently in different patients. And in different organs, tumor, the, what's called the tumor microenvironment is very complex, and it's different from organ to organ, it's different from patient to patient, it's changing all the time, it is recruiting some of, uh, some, uh, of your own immune system to help it grow, right? It is a very, very complex problem to deal with. And precision oncology is about going in and do, doing genetic mapping of the cancer in the particular patient, and then studying that and then developing specific drugs for that specific patient. Right? Now, already we have CAR-T therapy. CAR-T has virtually cured leukemia. Over 80% of leukemia patients today can be cured, completely cured, with CAR-T therapy. It's where they go into a patient, they take a sample of the patient's T cells, and then they arm these T cells with rockets and bombs, they make them much more powerful, they multiply them in the lab, then they put them back in the patient, and these T cells fight and kill the cancer cells. Moving on to electrification. Why is electrification important? Climate change. And if you take a look at the COP26 and the COP27 targets for 2035 and for 2040, we will be needing hundreds of millions of electric vehicles on the road replacing ICE cars, internal combustion engine cars, by 2035. Right? And these hundreds of millions of electric vehicles right, require power. They require charging stations, and charging stations need to get their power from somewhere. And that has significant implications on the grid. So whereas most people, when they think about electrification, they think about we need better batteries to last longer, to lengthen the range of the uh, automobile. But the real challenge is going to be on the electric grid, especially in countries where the electric grid is a legacy electric grid from 50 years ago. Some major modifications need to be done. We have to move from centra centralized power to distributed power to microgrids to uh, hybrid uh, grids, which take sources from uh, different places, include, include, including and especially renewables. And there's also a challenge to find materials for the batteries. Right? In fact, there's a huge gap between the known deposits of some of the metals required in your batteries, like cobalt, for example, like nickel, for example, like copper, in fact, there's a $12 trillion gap between known deposits and what we need to make the 400 million cars happen by 2035, a $12 trillion gap. So mining, uh, intelligent exploration are very important. These five megatrends collectively are going to change our lives forever. And I'm, and these five trends are going to be powered by machine learning to some extent, and to some extent by the hardware that drives the machine learning. And what I would like to do next is give you some examples of how machine learning is used in areas that you wouldn't think we use machine learning. Right? Let's start with high temperature fusion. High temperature fusion happens at 100 million degrees centigrade. Right? That's hot. And when you have 100 million degrees centigrade, what's your number one challenge? 
to contain it. How do you contain, how do you contain an environment at 100 million deg degrees centigrade? Now, we use massive magnets to, to help with that. Right? But the record, in terms of sustaining the reaction inside the reactor, is about 100 seconds at 120 million uh, degrees centigrade. And so machine learn learning is being, is being used on the containment front in terms of modeling the turbulent dynamics inside the reactor to better come up with improved structures to better contain the reaction so it lasts longer. Now, will, will high temperature fusion happen next year? No. Will it happen in 10 years? Probably not. Will it happen in your lifetime? Yes, it will happen in your lifetime. Another thing that will happen in your lifetime is quantum computing at scale. Larry mentioned a company that we've invested in, in. These are the early times of quantum computing. This particular portion of a quantum computer that you're seeing is using a technology called trapped ions. Each blue dot you see on the screen is a quantum bit. And quantum computers work on two principles. One is superposition, and the other one is entanglement. Superposition means that a quantum bit can be in multiple states at the same time. So it can be zero, it can be one, it can be in the middle, all at the same time. Now, you compare that to digital bits. All our computers today are digital-based computers. It can only be in one state at any given time. So if you have two digital bits, both can be zero, one can be zero, the other one can be on, one can be, the other one can be one, the other one can be zero, or they both can be one. And each one of these states can represent one piece of information. So zero, zero can represent one piece of information, zero, one. So if you have two bits, you can represent four pieces of information. But in quantum, zero, 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 one, one, zero, and one, one can all happen at the same time. Now, this massively improves and increases your ability to do compute. Massively increases it, exponentially increases it. The other part of quantum computers that makes them very special is entanglement. Uh, if you have two photons, for example, that are entangled, and I take one of the photons, leave it with me here on the stage, right, and give one of you the other photon and say, go to Abu Dhabi. So you take the photon with you and you go to Abu Dhabi. And if I change the spin of the photon here, instantly the photon you have in Abu Dhabi will change its spin. It's a phenomenon that really bothered Einstein because that meant to Einstein that there's something faster than the speed of light. And of course, to Einstein, there's nothing, nothing faster than the speed of light. So he had a hard time ex accepting that. But these two principles, superposition and quantum entanglement, enable quantum computers to do what they do. Quantum entanglement allows us to form quantum gates. So if you take a look again at the chip behind me, each blue dot is a trapped ion. These are ytterbium ion in this case. And by shining a light at two of them at the same time, we can form entanglement between these two and form a gate. Right? Now, what are the challenges of quantum computing? Scaling. So if you look at the trapped ions, the more you put in a row, the more they affect each other because of the electric fields between them. Ions, as you know, are atoms missing electrons. So there's a elect natural electric field uh, with them. So scaling to hundreds of bits and thousands of bits and tens of thousands of bits is a key challenge, not just for this technology, but for all quantum technologies, including superconducting uh, quantum bits. And another thing they suffer from, partly because of this and the noise associated with quantum computers, is immense error rates. So when you, when you hear about a company that put out a new quantum computer with a larger number of qubits. So when you hear about this company, for example, now has 500 qubits. They're Don't be impressed, because it's not the number of bits that counts. It's the number of 
logical bits that count. Logical bit is a perfect quantum bit, no error. Right? So if I have a quantum computer with 500 qubits with a lot of error, and you have one that has 10 qubits, but with much lower error, yours may be better than mine. So always think in terms of logic bits versus physical uh, quantum bits. And so where is machine learning helping there? Machine learning is helping in every phase of, the, of these uh, challenges, from classifying states to optimizing qubit control, to even figure out how to best form gates uh, with entanglement. Another area that machine learning is helping with is drug discovery. Now, what, what is the process of drug discovery? The, the first and most important challenge in drug discovery is figuring out what target protein you want to attack. So a disease employs proteins in your body to help it live, to nourish it, to help it survive. And the goal of a drug is to figure out which one of these proteins you want to attack so that the disease cannot use it. So you design a molecule that can go and attach itself to that target protein and stop the disease from using that protein. Right? And then you have to do that, and you have to take into account the possible toxicity. So all right, you're preventing this protein from moving around, from being used by the disease. Is that going to be toxic? You know, what are the off-target effects of that protein? Then you have to figure out if you can manufacture that, and manufacturing with high quality and high yield and at that reasonable cost. All right? Then you have to do clinical uh, testing. And all this costs billions of dollars to introduce one drug into the market. So the challenges are enormous in terms of drug discovery. And machine learning can help in each one of these phases. In fact, a company called Accentia has a machine learning platform for de novo drug discovery, for recommending new proteins to attack that target that I was talking about that doesn't even exist, completely generated with machine learning. Right? And it has this platform that optimizes across toxicity. So as it's, as it's designing the protein, the new drug candidate, it is looking at toxicity, it is looking at manufacturability, and optimizing across three. So I said that you know, these mega trends, that the five that were talked about, are being driven to a large extent by machine learning. And machine learning is getting better and better and better and growing. And now, now we have a new age for generative AI. Now, generative AI is not new concept. In the 1970s, somebody used generative AI to compose music. Right? So the concept is not new. But what's new is that in 2022, we saw the birth of DAL-E and chat GPT. How many, how many have you have used DAL-E? Show me your hands. Okay. How many have used chat GPT? OK, a little more. All right. All the images you see on the left side of the screen were generated with DAL-E. So in the first one, I asked it to generate a, an image of a car being powered by the sun. Right. The one below it, an image of a brain with a brain-computer interface in it. And every time you ask it to generate an image, it gives you four images, and you can choose which one. If you don't like it, you can, you can ask it to try again. Right. That's on the DAL-E side. On the ChatGPT side, I think it's going to be a huge driver of the economy, ChatGPT. If you're still Googling, you might consider trying ChatGPT rather than Google. Right? Because in ChatGPT, you can ask questions. And I'll show you examples of this. Uh, 
But the two together and this field of generative AI using large language models is going to be huge over the next decade. And you're going to see killer apps come out, one after the other, that use these language models. I'll give you an example. Think Google Maps. Now, Google Maps on its own is pretty good, right? It shows you how to go from point A to point B. But can you think of a killer app that's built on top of Google Maps, an API? Uber, somebody once said. Right? There's many, but Uber is among the most famous one. Same things will happen here. You have these large language models. You can't afford to have these large language models on your computers. right? Think about the challenges we have here. These have billions of parameters in them. Now, think of a parameter as a, as a relevant piece of information. Right? So GPT-3, for example, has, depending which version you're looking at, between 175 and 11 trillion parameters. The largest version of GPT-3 takes 2.5 months of training on a single NVIDIA chip. Now, of course, you're going to use a lot more than a single NVIDIA chip and do it in parallel, but it gives you an idea how complex these things are. Right? So you're not going to have a Google Map uh, software on your phone. You're going to have an API that calls it. Right? Same thing here. I can't, I can't wait, actually, to see what kind of app APIs will develop on top of DAL-E and ChatGPT3. Can you think of one? You're going to be in the next billionaire if you can think of a good one. All right. OK, let me give you an example of Chat, uh, ChatGPT if, if you haven't used it. So here I'm showing two examples. In the first example, I asked ChatGPT to explain how machine learning is used in quantum computing. And I wanted a series of bullets at the end. So it generated that paragraph that you see. And then I put that paragraph, not shown here. And I asked it, no, I don't want that paragraph. Just give me bullets. And it summarized the paragraph for me. It gave me bullets. But if you take a look at this, and if you take a sentence from the answer, and you plug into Google, you won't find it anywhere. ChatGPT is not perusing the internet and copy-pasting something to give you your answer. It's, not, it's generating its own text. And guess who owns the text? You do. It's your text. It's you, you do. Guess who owns the images after you generate them from DALI? You do, right? So just for fun, I wanted to see if it, you know, if it really can think. So I asked it the next question. I said, explain how a tooth toothbrush is used to design high temperature fusion reactors. Of course, the question doesn't make sense. But I wanted to see if Chad GPT can figure that out. It did. It did figure it out. I think Dall E and Chat GPT, in terms of productivity, are the best things we've had since the development of the internet. And I think it's going to be an amazing growth factor for the economy. And already we're seeing over 120 startups in the field of generative AI in the US alone. All right, so we talked about megatrends. We talked about AI as being a key horizontal technology driver of these megatrends. But what's going to enable these megatrends to happen on the hardware and on the communication level? Right? It turns out that there are some key challenges that we don't have the answer to today. Fundamental challenges, big challenges that we don't have the answer to today. And I'd like to take you through some of them. 
There are two seismic shifts that are happening. One on the energy side and one on the data side. Remember we said that semiconductor technology integrated chips are the principal engine that carries information, that produces information, that communicates information, that stores information. Right? If we can, cannot sustain the trends we are on today, we're going to be in big trouble in about 10 years. And there are two seismic shifts, as I said, one on the energy front and one on the data front. And these seismic shifts are so serious that the semiconductor industry in the United States put together a team of some 35 scientists to figure this out and to plot a course for what needs to be done over the next decade. And this, this, this group of scientists developed something known as the Decadal Plan for Semiconductors. It might as well have read the Decadal Plan for Science and Technology, because that's what it is. And if we cannot solve the problems identified in this decade of plan, like I said, it's going to be a big challenge maintaining those megatrends that I talked about earlier. Let's start on the energy front. Take a look at this chart. The green bar is the energy consumed by ICT globally. The green bar is the energy consumed by ICT systems on a global level. Now look at the trend. And look at the top curve. The top curve is the world energy production. If current trends continue in terms of scaling semiconductors, making things smaller and smaller, but they require more and more power, and if we take into account the trillions of sensors we're going to have, all the data that we're going to be producing, right? you'll see where the green line is headed if we don't do something about it. By around 2040, the power consumed by ICT worldwide will approach world energy production levels. Now, it's a shocking graph that ICT systems, if we don't do anything, will consume all energy produced on Earth. It's a shocking graph. It happens to be very true. And it is why, it is why that group that I was talking about earlier, the 35 or so scientists, got together. And so the grand goal in the decade of plan is to improve energy production of semiconductors by a million-fold. A great challenge. And a great challenge requiring a paradigm shift in the way we design computers, a paradigm shift in the devices we have, a paradigm shift in the network we have that connects these devices together within a computer chip. And maybe quantum will play a role there, maybe not. It is to be seen. Right, data is the other seismic shift. Data, if you think about it, is the best measure of civilization. How much we produce data is a key measure of how civilized we are. If we don't produce knowledge, we're not that civilized. But we are civilized, and we are producing an immense amount of data. If you go back to 300 BC, the planet was producing about 1,000 bits per capita, 1,000 bits per individual globally across the planet. Of course, the Gutenberg moment was a, a tremendous shift in terms of data production, and then the internet revolution. And, uh, and in 2020, we sat at about 10 to the 23 bits globally, which comes out to 10 to the 13 bits per every individual per year on the planet. Right? And that is going to be massively increase. Projections are that we will have 45 trillion sensors 
45 trillion sensors by 2032. So the blue line there that you see on the graph is the growth in sensors. And the green line that you see is the total human data consumption from the physical world. Now let me explain that a little bit. So if you take a look at the, uh, uh, at, at, at the picture of, of a head, it's receiving, through our eyes, we receive information at about 8.75 megabits per second. That's the amount of information we receive. But our brain can only process about 100 bits per second. So what gives? How do we do that? Well, the way we do that is we do data compression. Our brain does data compression. Our brain focuses on the most important relative, relevant information. So as you're sitting there listening to my presentation, you, your eyes are seeing everything around me, top to your sides. But you're processing, I hope, only what I'm saying. <laughs> That's data compression, right? So one of the goals of the data plan is to do data compression at the same ratio as we humans do data compression, 10 to the 5 to 1. Okay? That's a big, grand goal to achieve. But it is achievable. And we need you. We need your brains. We need your fresh way of thinking to help get us there. There's also a growing gap between the data we store and the data we communicate. So you see here on the graph that around 2020 was the year of inflection, where the amount of data we store per year exceeded our ability to communicate it. So currently, it's possible to transmit all the world's stored data in about a year. In 2040, it is predicted it will, that it will take 20 years to do the same thing. So in 2040, if you take all the world's data and you want to communicate it, it will take you 20 years if current trends stay the same and don't change. Another important aspect of data is our ability to store data. And this is an important slide that I want to talk about. So by 2040, it is projected that we will exceed 1,000 zettabytes of data. And calculations show that to store all that data globally, we're going to need 10 to the 14 kilograms of wafer-grade silicon. That's a lot of silicon. But current projections show that we will only have between 10 to the 7 and 10 to the 8 kilograms of wafer-grade silicon. Right? So that's another big challenge. How will we be able to store all the information that we will generate by that year if we don't invent a new way to store data? And you know what's a good new way to store data? Store it in DNA. Store it in DNA. So you can take up 10 to the 14 kilograms of wafer-grade silicon, or if you use DNA as a storage medium, convert binary to XS3 code, and then XS3 code to DNA code. Rather than 10 to the 14 kilograms of wafer-grade silicon, you will need one kilogram of DNA. One kilogram of DNA is enough to store all the world's data in 2040. And in fact, a few tens of kilograms of DNA will be in enough to store all the world's data for centuries. Now, what do we need to do to, to do DNA memory? We need to do DNA synthesis in a better, more efficient way than we can do it today, and more importantly, in a much more cost-effective way. Now, DNA sequencing, I talked about at the beginning, DNA sequencing cost, in 2003, about a billion dollars to do the sequencing of the human genome. 
By 2015, it cost less than $1,000. That's an unbelievable change in cost. Of course, the power of computing help, the idea of doing sequencing by synthesis helped. And last year, a company announced a $100 genome cost, actually less than $100. But in order for us to use it for DNA memory on the sequencing front and the synthesis front is behind sequencing in terms of cost, we will need to do it under 10 cents. Now, if we move from a billion dollars to $100, we can move from $100 to 10 cents. DNA storage will be revolutionary. And that's another thing that will happen not only in your lifetime, but I'm happy to say in my lifetime too. All right, so we need a paradigm shift in semiconductor technology and compute architecture. We are in the era of exaflops today, but we know for sure that the technology we have today will not be able to do zetaflops will not be able to do Zetaflops. Now, you can say, well, I could have said the same thing in 2008, that our technology back then could do petaflops, but we couldn't do exaflops. Yes, but we knew where we were headed with the same technology. Because we had Moore's law, we knew that we could reduce the size of a transistor. We could double the amount of transistors in the same area on a chip every about year and a half to two years. We had a cadence that we knew where we were going every two years. And so in 2008, we knew where we would be with the same technology we have, with the same rate of improvement by 2022. But that's not true anymore. It's becoming much tougher to scale, in fact, Scaling in the traditional sense of scaling stopped a long time ago, but we're finding new ways to shrink transistors uh, on, on a chip to go up 3D. But we need a completely revolutionary technology to be able to get to the Zetaflop regime. Okay, now I promised to talk about venture capital and how venture capital plays a role in all of this. Venture capital keeps a close eyes on these challenges. In fact, that's how we do our job. We look at the technology challenges, and then we look at which universities, which groups of students, which groups of startups are addressing these challenges. And if you look at the funding, in 2021, VC venture capital funding reached $630 billion. That's funding new ideas. And remember, VCs take a big risk. We take a big risk because nine out of every 10 uh, startups that we have fail. Medium-sized investments, about $5 million. And here's something you should look at. This is Series A funding from quarter three of 2022. Terawatt infrastructure, one company received $1 billion. In Series A funding, this is early funding. Right. Number of unicorns growing every year. Of course, in unicorns, the U.S. leads by a large margin. And so what the future holds for VC, VC is increasingly investing in deep tech, in deep technologies, future compute, climate tech, digital biology, and medicine. And will we get to a stage where we will cure Alzheimer's, Will we get to a stage where we have a cure for cancer? Will we get to a stage where I will communicate with you without talking through the brain-computer interfaces that we have? If we can imagine it, if history taught us anything, if we can imagine it, if we can dream it, it's just a matter of time. It will happen, and we will get there. And thank you very much. So, so thank you so much, Rafik. Um, so, Rafik, we're actually kind of out of time. 
Um, but uh, so, uh, are there any quick questions that anybody wishes to ask? Okay, so Rafik is going to be um, here in Building 20, in, you know, in front of the auditorium at four o'clock today. So um, I would suggest that um, if you're interested, please come back at four. Uh, Rafik is involved in um, all kinds of technology, as you can see. He also has a fairly large uh, purse or wallet. So <laughs> for those of you who are interested in uh, discussing some of your uh, great ideas for future companies, uh, good idea to come. So please come back at four. Rafik, thank you so much. Thank you.